A new report from the Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics suggests a set of recommendations that could build for more equity and opportunity for black athletes at Division I colleges and universities. Here to talk with us about this landmark report today and some of the implications for historically black institutions are two of the co-chairs for the study, Jock McClendon of the Los Angeles Rams and Shantiana Keys. I want to make sure I get this right, sister. Shantiana Keys of the Women's Basketball Coaches Association. Thank you, brother and sister, for joining us today. Thank you for having us. We're excited. Thank you for having us. So let's, let's talk about the overarching nature of the report. Now, we, we've seen the NCAA. We've seen advocacy organizations talk about opportunities for better equity and access of Black athletes, particularly at the Division One level. This sets out a set of recommendations that specifically speaks to some key areas about access. What can we do to make athletes more successful during their college tenure? How can we hire more black coaches and more black administrators within division one uh, programs, men's and women's? What is it that served as the backbone for this report? And upon its completion, what has been some of the feedback that you've gotten either from the NCAA or from some of your peers in coaching and in athletics that say that this, hey, this is a this is a much needed report and this is the time to get some of these recommendations done. <laughs> going, okay. Um, as far as I would say the backbone, um, you know, the Knight Commission tasked Jacques and I and, and Lynn um, with, you know, leading the charge for this. Um, and so for the backbone for us is, uh, and Lynn always says it, go from pledge to policy, right? So we've mm -hmm. had a lot of lip service in the past. Um, things have been caught in process or committee or people with the best intentions um, have tried to um, improve in this area, mm -hmm. but we wanted to have concrete things um, that athletic directors, institutions, the NCAA can do to employ to improve the experience. Um, and the feedback we've gotten um, has been great, but we definitely need to create more of a dialogue right now around this report and get some of these things pushed through. Yeah, and just to, just to piggyback back off Shantiana, like it's been an unbelievable process. And I think I've learned so much, right? Because I do think that there's such a discrepancy and that's why this thing was the uh, racial equity task force, mm -hmm. not the racial equality task force. Um, we as, uh, you know, as former athletes and, and minorities understand what that experience, what that experience is like. And it hasn't been an experience where everybody's on the same playing field. And uh, I hope that's one thing that people get from our report is that we're not operating as things are, are equal because they're not. But what we are trying to do is, is, is show that there needs to be more equity so we can close the gap. And so everything we're doing is about closing the gap and, and, and trying to develop best practices and, um, and, and protocols and procedures to be able to help with that. Let's talk about that, that, that equity, because that's an important thing. And one thing that is that is strong about this report is it specifically identifies HBCUs to talk about institutional equity, uh, particularly for the Division One programs. Uh, within uh, within the HBCU sector, a part of the the recommendations that you guys lay out is that there is more support from the NCAA for APR compliance and APR success rates. Um, we know that HBCUs over many years uh, have struggled um, and have been unfairly uh, targeted in some ways uh, in terms of uh, consequences for falling short of, of APR marks. These things have been suspended by the NCAA. Your recommendations have now come out to say, maybe this is something that you continue for a period. What do you think that APR looks like after this suspension period? Or should it go away totally when you think about what HBCUs, particularly in the resource area, struggle to cultivate in meeting that APR standard? Yeah, I don't think we will see the APR go away after um you know, not only this report, but after this two year suspension, I don't think we'll see it go away. And the Knight Commission has been um, an advocate for the APR and setting standards. Uh, but I'll say that, you know, there has to be a better understanding of the mission of HBCUs, right? Um, we talk about 70% of HBCU students coming from low income families and 40% of them being the first person in their family to enroll. Um, mm -hmm. There has to be a better understanding uh, with those who are legislating that that is that is the mission of these institutions. And so should they be held to the same standard? You know, we could have discussion about that. But we have talked about how long these students or excuse me, these organizations or institutions have to meet the standards. That is also important, especially when you talk about the systemic issues that have created 
some of the uh, some of the issues that we're talking about, right? Like these things didn't happen in a vacuum. So um, there just has to be a better understanding, I think, at um, the NCA office, and that includes, you know, having more HBCU presence um, as you legislate. Um, so those are a few things that come to mind um, for me in, in terms of that conversation. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with my, my co-vice chair. I mean, right. I think everything is predicated upon um, shifting the economics and we can't sit here and try to hold the standard of, uh, you know, a power five institution that's driving one hundred million dollars in revenue to the same thing that the HBCU does, even though those students are just as in need, just as um, just as hungry as those students. But the, the, it's not level. Right. So to say we can treat everybody the same without finding a way to make those uh, those practices fair. So we're, ne we're, we're never saying to take away a, a, a barometer of what that looks like. But we are saying they need to become more fair because the playing fields aren't level. So to set that expectation that it's, uh, you know, we live on this mountaintop of equality uh, with, when, when it comes to resources and availability um, is not fair to those students or to those institutions because they are trying to drive change. They are trying to drive academically diverse human beings that are coming, they're gonna come in and make an impact on this world. And, um, you know, we need to elevate that black voice. We need to elevate that minority voice, that female voice, and make sure that we're doing a great job of making it, making it equitable, uh, not equal. Is it is it fair for the NCAA as a an association of institutions to say, OK, we all need to put in to to make HBCUs better in this respect? Because I could I could hear and have heard the argument to say, well, you know, frankly and candidly, y'all ain't got to be here. Y'all don't have to be division one. So why, why is it why is it a why is it a responsibility of ours? To, dis, to create opportunities for you all to be, or for HBCUs to have more resources that contribute to academic performance, which in a lot of ways would make you more competitive with us. <laughs> and there's not too many institutions that say we want more competition from these set of schools. Um, I think, I'm oh, sorry, sorry, Keith. No, you got um, it. I think, I think over the past year, I think we've seen um, how elevated the black culture can be. Um, I happen to work in the National Football League. Seventy percent of my roster is black and brown, um, and seventy percent of the NFL rosters. And the NBA is probably an even higher number than that. When you look at these Power Five institutions, when you look at when you look at men's and women's basketball, like um, we minorities are very successful as athletes. Minorities are very successful in this space. But how many coaches do you see? How many administrators do you see? But what you saw over the past year is that the black voice is marketable. Let's go back to Black Panther with Marvel. Let's go back to Deion Sanders becoming the head coach at Jackson State. Let's mm -hmm. go back to ESPN Plus doing the special with Chris Paul and Lavelle Moton on what they've got going on down there. So, like, there, you know, when you talk about the, the platform that HBCUs have, it's very significant. And so um, if, if, if we're talking about making them member institutions, they deserve the same the same uh, sort of visibility and platform. But to say that it's the same, once again, is not is not fair, nor is it equitable. We need to put in practices that show that these HBCUs have immense value. Our, uh, the vice president of this country is an HBCU grad. Um, where we are in 2020 and elevating the, the black voice, the minority voice is a completely different, um, I'm sorry, 2021 is a completely different uh, position than we were just two years ago. Mm -hmm. And so we have an opportunity as an inflection point of this country to turn 2020 not into a moment, but into momentum forward. And I think that honestly, as, as, as uh, my co-vice chair Shantiana said earlier, we're trying to use this report as an opportunity to continue to propel that. And as we've seen, the HBCUs are at the center of this conversation because nobody has been talking to them and all they have done is stay true to their values, vision, and continue to produce outstanding candidates in this job world that don't get the same visibility, marketability, and voice as others. And so um, we have to change that narrative because there is so many dynamic people from a student athlete standpoint, student perspective, administrator perspective that deserves this voice. And when you look at what the ESPNs do with the undefeated, like people are listening and we got to continue to capitalize and, 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 and move forward and make sure that this, these voices are being heard. Do you, do you think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, son. No, sorry. no, I, I really didn't have too much to add, Jock, I think. He covered all the bases on that. I guess the only thing that came to mind for me is that all all these institutions have put out statements, you know, uh, saying that they support uh, racial equity and 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 the 
the process to get there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not even like recognizing that like HBCUs are there or were there, right? Because we were not allowed to go to their institutions. So like mm -hmm. if you were truly committed to the to uh, racial equity um, and the success of black people, even when they're not at your institution, then being a member institution that is fighting toward that end goal um, should be a no brainer. It, it's always felt like there's a, a bit of incongruence between the NCAA's mission and that of the HBCU. The HBCU takes all kinds of people from all kinds of places and all kinds of academic training grounds. In your report, you reference how many students are coming from low income communities and probably from under under resourced secondary institutions. Right. So how is it that the, the, the NCAA almost penalizes the fact that HBCUs in particular in particular with African-American athletes are putting uh, men and women in a position to try to raise them up to a standard of where you can graduate, you can earn a degree, you can be prepared for a job. You can also play a sport and that helps you pay for your schooling. Why does it seem like that mission is, is not aligned with the NCAA's mission of opportunity for, for student athletes, at least as reflected in APR? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if Jacques has something to, to contribute, but honestly, I really, I, I really don't have a great answer for the, for that. And uh, for, the people who make policy, right? Like I really do think there's an ignorance about uh, not only HBCUs, but again, the black experience as it comes to PWIs. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of that legislation comes from that ignorance um, or lack of understanding. You know what, I completely agree, right? And I think that when you talk about where we're at in this world, a lot of these policies were put in place at a different time of America, at a different time of, uh, of, of equity as minorities, as being black in this country. So um, as the world is continuing to evolve and needs to, needs to do, be on that same trail of, of evolution, um, these, these practices and policies need to be on that same pace. And they just haven't been, right? They've been put in place at a time to where, you know, let's call it, you know, 20, 40, 50 years ago to where the world was different than it is right now. So they need to be reevaluated, right? Reform is good. Uh, change is good. Uh, we just live in a world where people don't like to see that. And so I think that this is a unique opportunity to drive that reform, to drive that change, um, because it, it, it is very much needed. And, you know, I love I love what you just talked about right there. And, and, and what you what we forget is that being a student athlete is about a journey and all journeys aren't the same. They don't start the same. They don't end the same. But they should have the same end result in mind. And that is to, to uh, gainfully employ student athletes and propel them to uh, a, a successful life that they would would have not otherwise had, maybe. Um, I know for me, right, as somebody who comes from a single parent household, low income, uh, free free and reduced lunches growing up, I don't have, you know, I'm working on my third degree right now and I haven't paid for a single dime of any of them because people, because I've had the opportunity for scholarship. And, I, you know, that's, let's call it half a million dollars of free education. That's mm -hmm. shifting the economics, that's shifting right. resources. So when you talk about the systemic problems we have in this country, it really comes down to is that um, the black the black the black minorities us us as us as a people haven't been able to, to drive generational wealth and it's the same thing with the institutions we have to shift the economics we have to shift the resources we have to shift the platform visibility and narrative or, or we won't get anywhere right so this is a unique opportunity to be able to do that and guess what rising tides lift all boats and uh we need some people to be the tide because our boats are just as capable we just we just we just um need a little help getting there so that's a, you, you actually segue into an excellent point. Part of the recommendations that you guys have are for institutions to take a more monitored and holistic approach to candidate interviewing uh, to be more inclusive of minority uh, prospects uh, to develop sort of a Rooney rule uh, for collegiate athletics. We've seen across the board in, in, in sports, people kind of anoint their successor in coaching. Um, and that promotes a lot of uh, racial, uh, you know, being racially homogenous in executive roles, right? You guys have proposed a change to that. Do you believe that, particularly in Division One, if you open the door a little bit wider for more Black candidates to be considered, either even just for assistant positions, uh, for associate AD positions, sports information, athletic executives, that that may drain unintentionally the opportunities for HBCUs with limited resources to be able to afford and hire some of that same talent. Is that is that an un unintended consequence or how do you kind of balance that perspective? If you if you make it so more black folks can walk through the door over here, are they walking away from a door over there? 
See, I don't like to look at it like that. See, I see it as an opportunity for uh, increased value, right? Mm -hmm. Look what's happening to Jackson State. Look at what's happening to Tennessee State where they just hired Hugh Jackson, Eddie George. Um, you're talking about Pat White, the former QB of West Virginia, goes from Alcorn State to the running backs coach at South Florida, right? I think it provides more value to these to these uh, HBCUs. Look, look what ESPN doing, especially with Lavelle Moulton, as I answered earlier, right? I think that there's an opportunity to uh, promote, and it's just there's no different from a P. WI, right? Like, uh, you know, the, the, the head coach of the University of Florida interviewed for the Atlanta Falcons job. I think there's always going to be um, uh, a different platform from each individual candidate, depending on what their values and visions and, um, you know, opportunities that, that come into play. But this is also an opportunity to show that if you do go to HBCU, it shows that you can go, that you can go up a step. And I think that that provides more value to get more young talent in the pipeline because they're more visible. And so I, I don't look at it as draining talent. I look at it bringing more visibility to these jobs and opportunities and where people, you know, from a, a universal perspective, try to look down. No, no, you can go down here. You can be successful. And if you have alignment or dreams of going somewhere else, guess what? You can come accomplish that here at these HBCUs. You can come win a national championship at, a, a you know, in, in an HBCU conference. And look, if you want to go somewhere else, great. If not, you can sit here and be just as successful as you want to be. Um, you know, when you look at the platform that Howard has being in the, the nation's capital, right? Like there's a lot of value to that. You starting to see recruits actually, um, you know, you, you saw the, they, they, they've got their first five star last year, right? Like people are starting to pay attention. So I don't see it as, as, as uh, you know, unintended consequences. I hopefully see it as a strategic value. Mm -hmm. And if, as long as we look at it like that and, and, and not pessimists, like when, when you see more ESPN broadcasts of HBCU schools because more people are watching, because they have higher profile coaches and higher profile players, that's where we went. We need to get these these high profile athletes, these high profile coaches at this space, because in turn, that will drive more revenue for these HBCU schools and the pot will be bigger and we can start to shift the economics at the end of the day. Economics resources is what it comes down to, and I think this is a unique opportunity in time as an inflection point to be able to do that. Shanti, I, I would I would ask you as as a, as an athlete, as a coach, um, as someone who who observes and and recommends on policy for 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 colleges, universities, and the athletic sphere. Um, it seems to me, as as an HBCU graduate and as a lifelong fan of HBCUs, that even at the Division One level, our most successful programs across the board have been women's sports in, in, in recent decades, we've seen um, women's basketball nationally competitive uh, forging upsets against bigger teams. We've seen women's bowling win an NCAA division one championship. We've seen track and field at division one and division two excel and win championships. Do you think that there is, there is policy that can be created that, that elevates the, the profile of these programs, even though they are non-revenue bearing, they're not on television. But here's where even HBCUs can be, even with our resources and our facilities, nationally competitive. Is that a conversation worth having? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the conversation about NIL is a, a, a big contributor to that conversation, right? Um, if a player from a, a Division II uh, bowling team uh, has a ton of followers, whether it be hometown or just, again, their influence on social media, right? Like she could very well be competitive with a player who's playing at Clemson as a big time player in a, at a power five. Right. Um, so I think, you know, we will see here in the future, you know, once this NIL conversation is, is over that, th that legislation will help some of these other divisions um, and especially uh, HBCU um, student athletes. I, I think as, as we talked about, like black culture uh, is, by culture is culture. Like mm -hmm. it's the, we drive the conversation. So when you can allow the HBCU student athletes to be a part of that bigger conversation and bigger conversation of culture, I think we're going to see some revolutionary things that we have not yet seen. Do you think that on the subject of um, executive uh, opportunity, so HBCUs have always been at the forefront of uh, you know, opportunities for African-Americans as uh, athletic directors, as uh, senior women's administrators, um, for women in uh, athletic executive positions, HBCUs have been at the forefront. Do you think that in, in, in part of your policy making conversation that HBCUs could be a model for how you do these things in terms of executive talent search, in terms of recruitment and retention? It's one thing to bring a black person into a role. 
It's a one thing to recruit a black kid to, to play for you. It's another thing for that black student or that black executive to feel good about where they are. Is there a model that you think HBCUs can provide in that respect to accompany your report and say, here's how you get them and here's how you keep them and help them to be productive in these places? Absolutely. We talk about uh, a sense of belonging in our the, the black athlete experience aspect of this report. Um, and, and doing the research, research into that, and that is a part of retention, is having your student athletes feel like they belong. And the HBCUs are uniquely positioned to create that familial um, atmosphere, right? Like Jacques and I both, uh, we both grew up in the suburbs and, and went to predominantly white schools. And then we went on to college and did the same thing, right? Um, and that experience is very unique in that you always feel like an other. Uh, no matter kind of where you are. And so, yeah, absolutely. HBCUs are the model uh, in terms of how uh, a black student athlete can feel, uh, I don't want to say more at home, but yeah, you have that better sense of belonging, that obstacle is not there in your development as a, as a young adult. Yeah, I completely agree, right? I mean, we live in this world where the narrative is that you know, whether if you're at Hampton or Harvard, right? Like, of course, people check that people check the Harvard. Like, we just don't live in that world anymore. And I think it's very, um, uh, what's the best way? It's, un, it's unfair. And, and it's also just a short of, a, of having an equitable process to say that when when these key administrators uh, at these HBCU schools with limited resources are able to be successful, how would you not say they would be the best hires when the, the, these jobs come up at these power five institutions because they have unlimited resources? And so it just shows the political nature um, and the systemic problems that we do have in place. And yes, they could be a model, right? Because especially when you talk about, when you look at these major power five schools and the makeup of their, let's call it their uh, revenue generating sports, when you talk about uh, football, men's and women's and men's and women's basketball. And when you once again, you look at the representation key and it's probably about, you know, 65, 70 percent um, that, that that look like us or, or black and brown. Right. And so I think what happens is you create healthy relationships when the people up top are able to put the, the same lens as those athletes on. Uh, and I think that w especially for me. Right. I did not have my first black head coach until I was um, drafted in the National Football League by the Indianapolis Colts. And it was by the man, a, a, name, a, mean, a, name, a man by the name of Jim Caldwell, mm -hmm. who uh, did an exceptional job of leading men. And that was the first time in my life is I'm looking at somebody who wants to achieve and, and, uh, and climb the ladder within the uh, organizational side. It can happen, right? And that was the first time in my life, like, wow. You know, uh, other than other than watching Uncle Phil on Fresh Prince, right? Like, <laughs> you don't get to see those platforms. You know, just right. to show up. Like I said I grew up in a predominantly white community. I did not see um, successful black women and men put on a platform to show that this is what you can be. I just didn't see it. I didn't know it existed. And so, um, it's really important for me to continue to drive that narrative personally because I want to be somebody that you know, uh, young women and men could look up uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And so. Just, just you can't be what you can't see. So the visualization of that and what that HBCU um, a doctrine and uh, and hierarchy can do for the greater good, especially in the college sports realm, is 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 definitely something that needs to be um, implemented, projected, and, uh, and and have a snapshot of because a lot of people could use a dose of of how they do do things and how they are intentionally being diverse. Uh, because I can promise you an HBCU school would, would just as much to love ha to have a Caucasian member um, and, and, and include them in the in the fold just as much as, um, you know, doing what they do for the, the black community as well. That's why, because they're for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I think that, um, you know, it's, there's just this this real narrative that you can't be successful when you can be. And so I'm, I'm very much appreciative of the HBCU model. And I think that as as Dion and Eddie George and and, and uh, these schools are starting to show like, Guess what? We can put eyes on it because just as Shantiana says, the culture is marketable. It has always been marketable and always will be marketable. Uh, we just haven't had the right people telling those uh, uh, those stories and showing that visibility. So uh, now that we have that that momentum, we got to continue to keep our foot on the gas. And then the final question, and I, and I so much appreciate you guys' time. Um, it seems like on the HBCU side of things, we're moving along. You mentioned Deion Sanders. You mentioned Eddie George. Uh, we're seeing a lot more philanthropy surrounding HBCUs. But when you look at the PWI Power Five, you're still seeing stories like Texas got a problem changing the school song. You're still seeing things about Black Lives Matter protest participation. Uh, you're still seeing brothers and sisters <clears throat> who are saying, I don't feel comfortable here. 
you're still seeing stories about, you know, athletes being grouped together, something else in majors, something that your report talks about. And there's no consequence for that from the NCAA, really, uh, you know, for degree manufacturing or just passing brothers and sisters through and they don't have proper training. HBCUs are moving and and progressively kind of taking steps ahead for reasons that we, you know, we, we, we know um, some of them are tragic, but the PWIs are still stuck. Like we don't, we ain't ready to move yet. Do, do, do you have optimism based on your report, based on what you're seeing, that some of the changes you hope will come are soon coming or are we still far down the road from seeing things possibly changing? I think we're optimistic and I think we we have I think we have to be right like we I think people have been kind of grasping at what are some concrete ways to move this conversation forward again we've talked about pledges and and what's most important is is policy because that's the only way to kind of hold people accountable I mean I think that there are things within our report that can happen in the near future right we're we're not looking at five years down the road, right? We talk about eliminating standardized testing, right? That um, is based in eugenics. We, we know that that, that, that system is, is flawed, right? Uh, as you mentioned, the clustering, um, we also talk about pouring more money into uh, HBCUs via the AASP and giving more resources. Um, we spoke to um, a president of HBCU and he mentioned um, that you know, talent was being plucked away from his school because they didn't have the resources to pay them, right? So those are things that are, that can happen, you know, a month from now, a year from now that are, that are tangible um, and, and immediately have effect. Mm -hmm. The hiring, again, we talk about um, being able to see your, yourself and your coach, a coach with cultural competency, who isn't going to have an issue, like you said, of having to take down the, the school song, like the, all those type of things that um, some coaches just are not aware of and, and, and don't recognize that they're bringing, you know, a student into an environment. I went to a school that was the, uh, the old antebellum Georgia Capitol. That's where I went to school. So there's like Confederate things all around the town. Right. Mm -hmm. And thankfully I had a black coach in that space. Right. So that did make me feel more comfortable, but I just think, um, there are there are a lot of things we can we can do immediately that can can cause some great impact, um, and I look forward to that. Um, you know, I think she just hit the head on the nail right there. I think, but uh, you know, the only thing I would add is it, it really takes some um, educated accountability. And we live in a world where we can have conversations like this, dialogues like this. Um, student athletes have shown their power uh, via social media and holding uh, institutions accountable for their actions. And so um, I think we live in a world now to where it's not OK just to be in the status quo. And as long as the right people, um, the, the right group of people united are having the conversation, um, the, the social uh, media pressure that can be applied nowadays that will drive change. Um, it's just really fi figuring out who really is aligned with those actions, but who really wants to keep moving the needle forward because it will take work. But I do think educated uh, uh, accountability will definitely help move the needle and it, it, it can move sooner than uh, we, we think it could. But I do think it's all going to be predicated on who really wants to sit down, roll up the sleeves, have these conversations and do the hard work, but also being educated on what the work's on. So you have the right tools of the toolkit when you get to the table.